Hi everybody, I'm Glenn, and I'm going to be talking about Gecko S, which is a Unix-like operating system for 6502 machines. And yes, you heard that right. Picture or it didn't happen. Now normally when I show this, screen, this, this slide, I say, well, you guys all know who I am, and then I flip to the next slide. But there's so many people here this year, and so many new people, that I figure I better leave it on for a couple of milliseconds at least. Anyway, I've spoken here many times, and also at uh, the sadly now defunct C4 Expo in Cincinnati, and at World of Commodore you know, up in Toronto a couple times. And I normally talk about uh, programming languages for the Commodore 64, and I've talked about operating systems, but it's always been GIOS. Well, that's definitely worth talking about, of course. But I wanted to do a talk about some of the other operating systems available for the Commodore 64. And this one, Gecko S, is very interesting because it's kind of Unix-like, okay? And, of course, this is the 50th anniversary of Unix, right? So we should party like it's 1969, yeah? It's a PDP-11, right? Somebody would know. At this show, somebody would know. Anyway, I think it's a PDP-11. So yeah, um, Unix or a Unix-like operating system on a 6502. Right, okay. Um, let me put that another way. It, it has some hurdles to overcome, okay? Because on a 6502, first of all, there's typically no uh, memory management unit on a 6502. There are machines that have it. Of course, our, friend, our friend Jim Brain is rumored to be working on something, for example. But typically not. Of course, there's not that much memory to manage. Um, and there's no hardware uh, memory protection either. There's nothing like Ring 0 and Ring 3 on Intel. So a user process could just stomp all over the kernel if it wanted to. So that, that would be a problem. It's got a limited number of registers. Okay, that picture of the PDP-11, if I, if I have my facts straight, that thing had eight 16-bit general registers, right? What have we got on a 6502? Essentially, an accumulator and two index registers, and they all answer to different instructions. So the coding is gonna be a little more complicated as well. And the biggest one of all, 6502 does not have a register that says, this is where the stack starts. The stack is at 0100 now and forevermore. So what are you gonna do, you know, if you have a multitasking operating system, how are you gonna multitask? What are you gonna do with the stack? Because you have to preserve the stack for each process that's running. Well, I mean, surely you can't take that whole 256 byte stack and copy it out and copy a new one in every time you're doing a context switch, right? Well, we'll find out later how that works. <clears throat> Now, that's not to say that it hasn't been tried before, and there have been other Unix-y type uh, operating systems written for the Commodore 64. Outside of Gecko S, there's Lunix. Who's heard of Lunix? That's actually fairly well known, yep. And there's actually some kind of cross-pollination between Gecko, X, Gecko S and Lunix. There's Asterix by Chris Baird over in Australia. Who's heard of that one? What, one person, okay, that's fairly obscure, but it's there. I don't think the source code for that is available, is it? Sure. Yeah, I, I tried to find it and I couldn't. But. And then there's ACE, everybody knows ACE, all Commodore users anyway know ACE, right? By Craig Bruce, that's, yeah, that's very complete, but it's more like the, the utilities are Unix-like, but the operating system really isn't. Now, none of these are still being developed. And not only that, in most cases, the, the people that originally wrote them aren't even active in the community anymore. The exception to that, of course, is Andre Fashat, the guy who wrote Gecko S. And in fact, he was just recently in a, in, a, uh, in a thread on CBM Hackers talking about running fast serial on a 1541, an ever popular topic. And I even emailed Andre with some questions, and he was very gracious with his time, and he said, oh no, you know, you have this understood wrong, this is really how it works, and try this, and so uh, he, he is still active, he's still interested in Gecko S, and um, outside of that, Gecko S seems to me, of all of these, to be the most complete, the most Unix-like, and the easiest to work with from the standpoint of 
uh, build tools and documentation. So that's why I chose this one to talk about rather than some of these others. There's Andre, and uh, he works for IBM over in Germany. And when he first wrote GeckOS, interestingly, it was written for a homebrew machine that he built himself, a 6502 machine. And that machine did, in fact, have a memory management unit and it supported up to a megabyte of memory. So he didn't even have that stack problem when he first wrote GeckOS. But then he decided later on, since he was a Commodore guy, that he was going to port it to Commodore 64 and even the PET. If you look at his web page for GeckOS, you'll actually see a YouTube video of him demoing it on a 32K PET. You have to see it to believe it, I'll tell you. <clears throat> And uh, talking about how none of these have been touched in a while, actually the last point release of GeckOS was, was 2013, which is not all that long ago. And the source is available under GPL2, so Andre did the right thing there. This is the machine that he built to, to run, or, or rather the, the machine that GeckOS was written to run on. This is the one with the, uh, the uh, memory management unit and support for a megabyte of memory. And there were a number of different versions or variations on this machine. It's got brothers and cousins and so forth. If you go to that uh, web link there and look at the information about this machine, you'll see that he just recently, like two weeks ago, added a bunch of pictures to the gallery. So now there are pictures of this guy's you know, extended family and he, just pictures of him taking, he takes off one part and you can see what's under it and then very, very, very interesting to look at. But I wanted to, to show this picture because it's the most intimidating looking. All right, let's, let's talk about the features of GeckOS. And this is actually a pretty mind-boggling list. This is where we get to the stuff like, are you kidding? You know? It is, in fact, a preemptive multitasking operating system. Not only, and, it, and it has task priorities. Okay? Not only that, it's multi-threading. Now, on the Commodore 64, and I'll be talking exclusively about the Commodore 64 version of this, you can build it for you know, a number of different architectures, like I said, uh, just by changing build time options. But on the Commodore 64, there are a maximum of 12 tasks and 12 threads. And since, of course, by default, every task has one thread, um, if you start running a bunch of multi-threaded programs, you'll run out of available threads long before you run out of available tasks. And I'll be demo demoing some of these features with some programs that I wrote. It's got signals. If you know the PID of another program and it has registered a signal handler, signal handler, you can send a signal to that process and by God it'll get it because it's taken care of by the scheduler during interrupt time. So it's guaranteed to get a signal. It's also got semaphores. I mentioned before about how a user process could stomp all over the kernel because of the 6502 architecture. Well, the way around that is to have semaphores and, and if you follow the APIs like a good citizen, and you wanna do something, you're probably gonna ask for a semaphore and try and lock it before you use certain communication buffers, for example. <clears throat> and I'll be demonstrating that as well. It's got redirection in the shell. These last two I haven't worked with too much, but it's, it also has support for piping, environment variables. I mean, you go down the list and it, it just becomes more and more amazing. And it's got a standard library that Andre wrote called Lib6502. This is this was meant, I think, for uh, compatibility with uh, other projects that people were working on, and in fact. As I understand it, Linux uses the same standard library. And this is the interesting part. It comes with a cross assembler called XA. And <clears throat> now those of you who know me know how I feel about emulators and cross development tools, okay? But um, you know, when you're dealing with an operating system, basically all bets are off. And if you want to learn Gecko OS, if you want to really learn dig deep into it and learn how it works or read, write code for it or whatever, really the only way to do it is to run it in an emulator and to build it with cross-development tools. So, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm kind of against the use of emulators and cross-development tools except where the life of the programmer is in danger, okay? And it's, it certainly is when it comes to an operating system. Now, 
the output of this assembler is a relocatable file format, which again, Andre came up with. And um, of course, you're going to need that because if you're running a bunch of programs that are multitasking, you're going to need to be able to load code at a more or less arbitrary address. So when the kernel loads a program before it, before it gets executed, he's going to do all the address fix up and everything like that. And it also, if you ask politely, produces an address uh, uh, cross-reference with addresses. And with just a couple of little standard Unix utilities, you can take that, that cross-reference and convert it to something that the vice monitor can read in. And if you do that, you can have labels. <coughs> and you can say, disassemble the code at fork. So that also makes it very pleasant to work with. When I started learning Gecko OS, I, uh, I was using a super snapshot, which if you're not a Commodore person, that's a hardware debugger. And I found it really hard to work with. I wanted to be single stepping. I wanted to be using labels and all this other kind of stuff. I, I mean, really, you, you really need to use cross development and emulator. And as I was working on this, and I've got a couple of printouts of, of this at my table, and they've already started to disappear, so I'm going to have to go and print some more. But I started work on uh, a, a, a I guess a commentary, you would say, on the, on the uh, internals of Gek OS as I was learning it. Because you know what happens, of course, is when you start on a big project like that and you start, you're, you're starting to learn something and you go, oh yeah, I, I should write this down so I remember what I found here, you know, and you come back the next day and I go, oh, where was that thing? Uh, oh yeah, 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 you've got this little scrap of paper here and of course pretty soon you've got a little scrap of paper here, and a little scrap of paper there, and a pad over here, and a notebook over there. Uh, and I said to myself, well, why don't I just make a little web page for it, right? That would be easy for me to consult, and not only that, it would be easy to share with other people. And I don't know if I left it up here. Oh, look, that's a bee box. Um, yeah, here it is. Um, so this is what I've been working on as a, as a sort of commentary on GeckOS. And if you want to learn about it, uh, I would recommend this, not to toot my own horn, but uh, I, I've spent a lot of time and effort learning it, and you can learn everything about it just by looking at this. It tells all about the source file layout, how to build it, what happens when you bootstrap, uh, how the scheduler gets started, um, you know, the, the IRQ service routine and all that kind of stuff. And it's all, it all has file names and line numbers in the commentary. So you should be able to follow, you know, if you have a question, I heard it can do this thing X, you know, and how, how would it even do something like that? Well, you can look at the commentary and find where it is in the source code and start poking around in the source code. And by the way, the slide title is with apologies to Professor Lyons. <clears throat> Nobody knows who Professor Lyons is, the Lyons commentary. <laughs> All right. so. Now, going back to what I was saying before about 6502 and um, the stack and how difficult it would be to do any multitasking because of the fixed stack. So with, with all this study, I should now be able to answer that question, right? And yeah, I can. So first of all, yeah, the multitasking is interrupt driven and it's generated by a timer interrupt, it does, it not, not a, a V-blank like in the standard Commodore 64 operating system. And the stack, here's the secret, is divided into two parts. The upper three quarters of the stack is reserved for the kernel. And the lower 64 bytes are for user programs. So, so when, you want to do, when you want to switch from user mode to kernel mode, well, that's pretty straightforward. All you got to do is flip the stack pointers around, preserve the registers, and you're essentially good to go. But what happens now when you want to do a context switch between two user tasks? That's a little more complicated. Well, you have to take the current tasks stack, copy it to a save area, copy in the stack of the new task that's about to run, flip their stack pointers around, restore the original tasks registers, and then you can run it. Now that sounds like a lot of work, but okay, we're only talking about 64 bytes, and remember, it only has to copy from the current stack pointer on up to that 64 bytes, so it's really not that bad, okay?
Okay, and the multitasking is fairly smooth. You'll see that in the demos. In fact, I think it's demo time. So let me put my money where my mouth is and we'll see what we can. Video. Computers. Video is Commodore 64. Okay, it plays video games, so video is for the, yeah, okay. So this should take a few seconds and then it should flip over to the Commodore 64. Hey, all right. Now, oh, and I'm running this off of 1541 Ultimate. My God, I'm not gonna be able to see what I'm doing. I didn't think of that. Yeah, uh-oh, raw, raw. Uh, let's do this, and this, and this, and this, okay. Luckily these demos take a little while to load so I can like start it and then run over and. <laughs> so here's what happens when you start Gecko S. In a nutshell, there's a basic loader which then in turn loads this big ROM image, C64 ROM, so-called because on Andre's machines that is actually in ROM. And then it loads a second very small loader in machine language that disperses that, that big image above and below I.O. at the top of memory and then starts the, uh, starts the ball rolling here. So we can see that we've got init, we've got a file system driver, We've got an IEC specific driver, and uh, it's starting two shells, okay? Now, um, the, the reason there are two shells is because originally that, that first shell was written before the standard library existed, and it, it basically uh, makes kernel calls to do what it needs to do. And the second shell, the one that's LSH, and I'm assuming LSH stands for LIB6502 shell, uh, that second one is actually much nicer, um, but it doesn't quite have yet all the features that the old shell has. Now, Gecko S supports virtual consoles. And since both of these are running, they just happen to be running on different consoles. So if I just tap F1, here's the second console with the old shell. There's nothing on three, nothing on four. We go back to one. And there is an incantation to start a program on a specific console if you want to. Now I wanted to show the old shell because it's got a real interesting command based on a kernel call by the same name. How about that, huh? So this is something like a PS display. However, it has a few little peculiarities. First of all, remember I said there, there's a maximum of 12 tasks and we have, what, 15 lines. So those bottom three lines are not meaningful there. And on the left, we see the PID. Notice that the PIDs go up by 14 every time. That's because the PID is actually an index into the task table, which has 14 byte entries. The second column is name, and that is also not meaningful. The, the docs say you should get up to the first five characters of the, of the process name, but it, it's just not currently implemented. I asked Andre about that, and he said it was a question of memory, you know, just to store that for all the processes. Would be nice, though. In fact, it's, it's not only not implemented, it's not meaningful, because the first process is not, in fact, the shell, it's in it, okay? The next column is, TH number of threads, number of active threads. So you can see that we have five processes running right now. That corresponds to what we saw on that startup screen, right? We have init, we have two file system drivers, and we have two shells. And they go in order from top to bottom, right? So next one, environment. There's only one environment. We don't have environments per process on a Commodore 64. PA is the parent process, FF meaning that it was started directly by the kernel. And the other four, of course, have a parent process ID of zero, meaning they were started by init, which is that first process where it says LSH, but it's not. M, uh, ME is the maximum amount of memory it's allowed to use. They're all 78 because 78 is where the kernel starts and you, you daren't go any higher than that, of course. The next column, signal mask, okay? These are what signals 
each of those processes has registered a handler for. And if you look, you'll see that the LSH shell, which is the fifth one down, PID38, has registered, what is that, five different signal handlers. Sig A, the next column, that's the address of the, the uh, signal handler. And then, of course, you have your, your uh, streams, the streams that the process is using. And the ones that are negative numbers, those are the standard ones, standard in, standard out, standard error, standard null. So that's pretty cool. Um, let's go back to, now this is gonna get a little hairy here <laughs> since I can't see myself. <laughs> We'll see how good my typing skills are, and that's not a very good bet, but hey. Um, it has, the shell has a lot of the things you would expect to see. So for example, we can take a directory listing, okay. That actually runs fairly quickly off a uh, 1541 Ultimate, doesn't it? Uh, it's nice. And a lot of Unixy things that you would expect work just fine. Oh, by the way, I gotta make sure I show this one. Huh? Huh? Okay. <laughs> you know, that reminds me, I went to Linux Expo 98 in Raleigh, and, uh, you know, Linux was still a fairly new thing at that time, and Linus Torvalds gave the keynote, and he comes up on stage, and he plops his laptop down there, connects it to the projector, and he pushes the button and walks away, and here's just the laptop on stage, and it starts booting Linux, and everybody claps. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, um, stuff like this works as you would expect. Boy, I hope I'm not making any typos here. Yeah, okay, so for those of you who don't know me, wizard is my cat, okay. And that, that does just what you would expect. No, no typos? Okay. And that also does what you would expect it to do. So no output, where did the output go? Well, it goes exactly where we think it would go. And I can cat that file, get it? <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> I'm very sorry for that. <laughs> it, it took a while to load. Okay, and so that does what it's supposed to do. And, and there are a bunch of other little commands like this. It's, it's, it's really very Unixy and it does what you'd expect. But now I'd like to show um, some more of the features of the operating system itself. And to do that, I wrote some programs using that, that cross assembler. So I have three demos to show. The first one demonstrates forking and multitasking. And there are two programs. In fact, all these three demos are gonna follow about the same pattern. The first program forks the second program and then there's some interaction between them. So, Excuse the names, these, are, these two programs are called forking and forked, because forking, forks, forked, and you know, I was gonna call them knife and spoon, but I don't know. Anyway, here is forking. And what he's gonna do, he's gonna fork off a second process. Fork, forking, forked, yeah. Okay, now that second process is flashing the border. First program is still running. First program ends, second program still running. Now the second program ends, okay. So that's not bad, that seems pretty, that, that huh? <laughs> I know Andre's gonna be watching this video, so if you clap, I'm sure he'll be very appreciative. Um, <laughs> and um, okay, so that's the forking one. Now, um, I have one that demonstrates, oh, wait a minute. I, we have to do the schema demo. Is schema in here? No? Okay. Um, when I first got this running, I was so excited, I actually took a video of it, and I posted the video in uh, IRC. And schema saw that video and he said, well, that's all well and good, but you know, what you have to do is background it and take a directory listing, listing while it's running. And I was like, well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, let's try it. I'm sorry, what? I, can't, I can't see it. Let me try again. You guys are keeping me honest with the typos. Okay, good. So now, and this is gonna be a little harder, but 
so I'm going to background the demo, and when I get my, whoops, when I get my prompt back, I'm going to ask for a directory listing. <laughs> so now we have all of this going at once. <laughs> All right, that's the first demo. Um, then I have one that demonstrates signal sending. So the first program is going to fork that second program. Yep, it's, it's OK. And the second program is immediately going to register a signal handler, OK, setting sig user mask. And then the first one says, hit a key to do the sending. OK, meanwhile, that second program is running a little loop on a timer saying, OK, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, just so you know he's still there. And when I hit a key, OK, SIG send, that's the, it's SIG send and SIG receive. SIG send sent the signal and ended. And then SIG receive, he got that signal, and then he ended. OK, so that's signal handling, and that, that works really well. Then the other thing I wanted to show is um, semaphores. And in this case, the two programs are semlock and semblock. The, the second one is not actually blocking. Um, well, more on that later. But <clears throat> the first program, in this case, is going to acquire a semaphore immediately when it starts and then fork the second program. So there he got a semaphore named SemSenby. Now he's forking the second program. And the second program is going to try and do the same thing. He's going to try and acquire that same semaphore. And he can't get it. He's trying over and over and saying, well, I'm waiting. I'm trying to get the semaphore. I can't do it. When I hit a key, the first program, I have to hit a real key, not a function key. OK, so the first program freeing semaphore and ending. And then the second one is like, oh, now I can get the semaphore, so now I'll end as well. So those are my demos. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Who would have thought you'd ever see something like this on a little tiny machine like this, right? So now I'd like to show a little, little scraps of source code for each of these programs so you can see how easy it actually is to write programs that do this stuff in Gecko OS. Um, the, the code to implement it, of course, is not that, that simple, but writing code, writing user programs to do it is. So in the case of forking, all you have to do is pass the address of a fork structure and then call fork to. Okay? It's as simple as that. And the fork structure just has those three streams that you're going to use plus the name of the program to load from disk and optionally any command line parameters and then two nulls at the end so he knows where the end of the table is. So very straightforward, easy to work with. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, let's, uh, and it's computer, yeah? There you go. Hey, all right, we'll try that again. There it is. Okay. So you pass the address of that fork structure, and then you call fork2, which is a library routine, not a kernel routine. It's a live 6502 routine. And that's all that's in that fork structure is the three uh, streams that you're going to use and the name of the program to fork, and two nulls at the end. And notice that fork2 returns the child ID, so you, you have that and you know to do it. Now, this is the second demo, the signal one. And of course, the right-hand side is what happened first, because when that second program started up, it registered a handler, and then the first one said, let me know when you want to send the signal. So to register a signal handler, you call set sig. And there are two versions of that call. By, by convention, the ones in capital letters are uh, kernel calls. So if, if, you're pa if, you're, if you're calling it with carry set, like the first one there, that means you're passing the address of the signal handler. And if you call it with carry clear, the second call there, that means you're passing a signal mask, a bitmap signal mask. And in this case, I was just asking for one signal. And then on the left, when it's time to send the signal, the first program says, yeah, OK, he, here's the signal I want to send. And in the X register, he's got the PID of that child process that he forked. Okay. Well, he knows what the PID is because the fork routine returned it in the X register. 
and he saved it since he was going to use the X register for something else. He loaded it back in, called SenSig, and whoosh, across it went. The semaphore thing, again, this stuff is all, you know, it's just a few lines of code. If you, if you look at my demo code, my demo programs, it's mostly like error handling and printing out those messages and doing a timer loop and all stuff like that. The actual guts of it is about this much code. So here's the uh, semaphore, and both the first and second programs in the demo are calling this same code. There are two versions, again, of PSEM, which is how you acquire a semaphore. If you call it with carry clear, it will block until you get the semaphore, maybe forever, okay? If you call it with carry set, it's guaranteed to return, and you're gonna get either EOK, meaning yes, you've acquired the semaphore, or ESEM set, meaning that semaphore is already spoken for, no, you may not have it, okay? And there are some other things you can get back, error, error codes and so forth. Then, you know, then the second program starts up and he makes the same call, and instead of EOK, -OK, he's gonna get ESEM set every time and he keeps going in a loop waiting. And then the first program, when you hit a key, he calls VSEM, just past the semaphore that you wanna release, I'm done with it. Now the next time the second program gets his turn running in the scheduler, he says, oh yeah, now I can get it. So yeah, very sophisticated stuff and easy to work with from a programmer's point of view. I'm, I'm trying to drum up interest in Gecko S here among Commodore guys, if you could, couldn't tell. And not just Commodore guys, you know, it runs on other 6502 machines as well. And in fact, um, if you look at the source code, there's an arch directory with C64 and, and his, his machine and everything else. There's also like a prototype directory where you could start your own you start your own version for a different 6502 architecture. So we maybe we'll see an Atari version, or a, I don't know. Um, so having seen all that wonderful stuff, what can I do with GeckOS, okay? What am I gonna do with that? I've got all this stuff at my fingertips now. Well, the obvious answer, you know, is, and I can tell you that, yeah, I had big fun playing around with this. Um, not only is it, is it great fun to play around with, just because you're continually surprised at what it can do, but also just reading the code because uh, it's really very good 6502. It's, it's the kind of code where you look at it, you look at the 6502 code and you say, well, what is that supposed to do? That, that doesn't even do anything, you know? And then you look at it again, it's like, I see what you did there. You know, there's code like that all over the, all, all over the place. He pulls every trick in the book. You could use it to learn about operating systems, okay? Now, you could say to yourself, I'm gonna learn the Linux kernel, right? We'll see in about five years, okay? Or you might say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read Professor Tannenbaum's book and, and learn the Minix kernel, right? Well, a couple months maybe and you, you'd be good at it. Or you could say, I'm going to read Senby's commentary on GeckOS and I'm going to learn the GeckOS kernel. Hey, you know, we're talking a couple of weeks and you'll be up to speed. Uh, so obviously you're not going to be learning Solaris or anything, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's very interesting to see how things like that signaling and the semaphores and so forth are, are implemented. The scheduler and the task switcher are, just, are really just fascinating. Oh, you could write the killer app for Gecko S. What might that be? Hmm. Huh? Wolfenstein. <laughs> Wolfenstein, somebody said. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, well, you don't have graphics, and I wouldn't recommend trying to do soft 80 column display because you have already got four text buffers for four consoles. So I, I really wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> All right, um, but, but first, before doing any of this, um, and, and yeah, be, you know, before you finish that Wolfenstein port, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think that there are things, I wanna make it clear now that I'm not criticizing GeckOS because it's a tremendous achievement, but there are some things that could be done, I think, to, to make it a little easier, uh, easier to work with. So some of these are low-hanging fruit, and some of them are more ambitious as we get toward the bottom of the list. But one thing, I would have killed for this when I was writing those demos, okay? The question is, how would you implement it? Who's gonna listen for the control C, the shell, or should the programs that are running listen to it? 
And what if the program is not expecting keyboard input? If it's a batch style program, you know. So questions about how you would implement it, but this, boy, this would be a nice thing to have. <clears throat> I mentioned this when I was talking about that info, info display. Not having the program names in that display uh, is a little problematic. I mean, you have to do a little detective work before you find out what it is that you're, you're working with and, and which process to kill because, yes, I've had some accidents. Um, but like I said, Andre said the reason he didn't implement this is for reasons of <clears throat> memory. But if you think about it, I mean, assuming a 1541 drive, 16 character file names times a maximum of 12 processes, that's what, 100, 192 bytes? That's not too bad, okay? You could live with that. Um, another thing that would be helpful is if you had a way to tell where a program has started running, because how are you going to debug your stuff if you don't have that? Now, you may have noticed that as I was doing those demos and taking directory listings and all this other stuff, every time I started a program, it said exec address, and then there was a hex address, okay? The reason it shows that is I asked Andre this question, and he goes, oh, there's a debug flag that you can turn on, and, and the kernel will do that, you know? So the kernel, after it gets the program loaded, it does the address fix up and everything else just before it's about to pass control to it, it goes, oh, yeah. Ex exec address, so and so, yeah. But it would be neat if that were stored too, okay? Another two times, tw what, 12 processes is 24 bytes, not bad, you know. But, now if you had these two things, that means that you could write a proper PS for the new shell, the LSH shell, and boy, would that be a nice thing to have, huh? In fact, why not get rid of the old shell completely? This is what I call the grand unification of the shells in Gecko S, okay? And I know Andre has thought of this from time to time, too. So if you could just, everything that's in the old shell that's not in the new shell, port those features over, and then, you know, you could just get rid of that old shell and not have it loading by default at boot time, which, by the way, is, of course, taking up a lot of memory. And I didn't even demonstrate this, but that, that old shell, it actually has an embedded machine language monitor. So there's some memory being used there, too. But when you build that old shell with the monitor, it's got compile time flags where you can build it with both together, or you can build just the shell or just the monitor. So you could still have the monitor, and you could have it not loading at boot time. You could have it a, make it into a program that you would load from the command line if you really wanted to use it outside of using the vice monitor. And yeah, that would be great. You could take that old shell and mark it as deprecated, and that would be the end of that. Then you would have the new shell. Now on to the more ambitious ones. Device support. How many Commodore users in here? How many of those people have CMD hard drives? Oh, pretty fair. Well, I guess considering where we are. I think. Um, but yeah, it would be neat to have support for some of the specific stuff that you see on CMD hard drives, like directories, partitions, all that kind of stuff. Um, pardon me? Token ring? <laughs> Wait, I'll talk about network networking in a minute. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can show you where the, where the source for that kind of stuff is. Um, yeah, REU, RAM expander on the Commodore 64. When I first figured out how that um, uh, task switching is working with the, with the, t the uh, stack being switched out and everything, I thought to myself, well, gee, imagine if you put those stack buffers in the RAM expander and then instead of copying bytes back and forth when you did a swap, you would just do a, a what is it, a, a stash and a fetch operation from the RAM expander. That'd be great, you know. And I actually had that as a to-do item on that on that analysis page. Andre saw that and he said, "Well, yeah, then you could write a file system for the RAM expander." I'm like, that, that, that's still a little beyond me, you know. But uh, yeah, that that would be a neat thing to have too. Also. Uh, you know, in the, by, the, by the same token, micro IC and 1541 Ultimate support. I, I thought it wasn't running on these devices, and I just found out this morning that it did because I hadn't tried lately, and I don't know what, but yeah, it, it, it will run from a disk image on both micro IC and 1541 Ultimate. But 1541 Ultimate also has something very interesting. It has... Networking, it has token, no wait. 
ArcNet, yeah. <laughs> Let's not get crazy. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you could you could uh, you could write a device driver for the networking in 1541 Ultimate, which has fairly recently been uh, reverse engineered. I, I know it wasn't originally documented by Gideon, but uh, and here's where I talk about networking in GeckOS. I don't want to give the impression that GeckOS itself does not have networking. It does, and if you saw that, uh, if you noticed during the directory listings when I was showing them before, there was. HTTPD, Telnet, there's a remote login program, that's all there. But it's all dependent on RS-232, so it's TCP IP over RS-232. Now, the, the, the RS-232 support, by the way, is, is apparently very good. I mean, I haven't played around with it much, but it, it even supports the uh, Daniel, Daniel Dahlman's UP9600 driver. So the serial support, I'm sure, is very good. But to do this networking stuff, where you saw those programs in the directory list, it, it requires having a slip connection, okay? Now, this is probably a foolish, foolish question at this show, but how many people know what a slip connection is? Yes, every hand in the room goes up. Okay, now, let me ask a second question. How many people still know how to set up a slip connection? <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, what did I get, about two hands, three hands, whatever? Okay, and that's the problem. Um, you know, in my case, for example, I've never set up slip connection in my life, so I couldn't get this working. To, I, you know, no matter what, I, I couldn't get it to work. Um, you know, my first, uh, my first exposure to the internet outside of Genie and Delphi was on Exec PC with a triple P dial-up account. Yeah, right. And uh, I, I had a great script written with expect and everything else. You know. But slip, I have no idea. I have no idea how to use it. So I've tried to get it running, and <laughs> the results were somewhat disappointing, shall we say. But it is there. There's a slip daemon, and, and he's even got a page with instructions on how to run it. So if somebody knows how to do slip, and you want to have an adventure, stop by my table, and we'll, we'll see if we can get that stuff working. OK, so here's the obligatory resources slide. I'm going to publish these slides as soon as I get back to my table. I'll put them on my website. And I think I'm going to reprint my table sign and put a URL on there because everybody is saying, where can I find this stuff? And I don't have anything there. Um, but yeah, there's, there's GeckOS. There, there are pre-built disk images for it. And I may release a disk image based on the minor changes that I've made so far. I do actually have both Andre's original code and my branch uh, in a GitLab uh, repository. So if you want to see my code, you can see it. There, so far, there aren't many changes except for adding those crazy demo programs. And of course, then there's Sembi's commentary on GeckOS. So we, we've seen you know, what it is, what it can do, some fun things there might be to work on. Um, do you have any questions? I don't think it was supposed to do that. It's supposed to say questions in big letters. <laughs> like that. OK. So does anybody have any questions about GeckOS? So one thing, you mentioned like swapping um, the stack segment for the user application. Obviously, on a C64, you've got 64K of RAM. Pardon me? On, on a C64, you've got 64K of RAM. That's going to limit how big your programs are. Does it have support for swapping? <laughs> that, that one I wasn't expecting. No, not that I know of. Um, I mean, there's certainly nothing like a, a you know, virtual file system with all that, all that kind of good stuff. Um, that's interesting. Now, now my gears are turning right away. How would you implement something like that? But no, it does not have support for anything like that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, boy. I don't know those numbers. The question was how much zero page and where uh, is it using. I, I would, I'd have to point you to the source code. I can show you where it is. There's, there's a special in, include file that just has the definitions for all that stuff. Um, when I need zero page, I just use a, a, a segment for that in the assembler. You know, so you have text and BSS and all that stuff. So I just say, I want some zero page. Give me some, and I don't care where it is. Um, well, it depends, and this is where you get into that semaphore business, okay? 
And, and so, so if you're going to use a, a sensitive zero page location, you might want to protect it with a semaphore and document the fact that if another program wants to use that, he should, yeah. What, whether the assemb yeah, the assembler, of course, is not going to know what other programs are doing. So you can't, uh, you can't say, you can't guarantee you're going to get some zero page that somebody else isn't using because that's a, that build time, not at run time. Mr. Mackey. Yeah, we've got geo link for geos. Are we going to have Gecko or Gecko as? Gecko. You know um, I've been asked that one. Like, yeah, I, I, yeah. Uh, he won. Like that, that was Dr. Dan. He wants to know if I'm going to port my GS IRC client to Gecko S, and the answer is no. <laughs> no, I mean. I will tell you once you've once you've written an IRC client, you'll probably need therapy for the rest of your life. So no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but there are all kinds of interesting. You know, I've been there, done that. I would like to do something else, something interesting. I, I wrote a Gopher client too, you know, and so. But yeah, I'm I'm not sure yet what the killer app would be. But it, it would have to be something that uses all that fancy multitasking. The gentleman in the shirt here. Is it uh, cooperative or preemptive multitasking? It is preemptive. Uh, the scheduler runs on an interrupt, and you know when it's you 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 wait your turn, right? Okay, so, um, and there are priorities. The priority is implemented as a simple counter. So if a priority three task comes up to run, the first thing the scheduler does is set a, a, a system variable to that priority, and then it runs it. Next time there's a uh, next time the scheduler runs, first thing it does is look at that, and if it's non-zero it decrements it and exits until it goes down to zero. So that means that the, the priority three program gets three slices. Yeah. If you have a runaway program, can you switch to another shell and kill it from there? Yes. In fact, we, that happened over at my table just a few minutes ago. Yeah, you, there is a kill command, and it does work. Any other questions? Yes? Um, in your looking at that code, do you have a feel for how hard it's going to be to port this to, say, you know, a C128 or something? Um, I mean, I think we all understand that the Apple and Atari computers and programmers aren't capable of making a Gek OS uh, port. You know, just <laughs> we all know that. But what does it look like for for uh, for the porting actually? Uh, uh, again, I think you'd have to look at the source code. I can tell you the source code is is, is a uh, a bit of a labyrinth um, because the, the the number of defines and if defs and stuff in there is is not inconsiderable uh, because it supports. Remember, it's not only supporting a couple of different architectures like 64 and PET, but Andre's machine and Andre's machine has memory management and so. It's, there, there are if defs all over the place. But I don't know if you hear what I mentioned before. If you look in the Arch subdirectory of the source code, there's a C64 and a PET and everything else. And then there's also like a sample subdirectory that, that you can use as a starting point for uh, uh, making another, another version of it for a different architecture. Personally, I'd love to see it run on the cactus, but that's it. Yeah. Uh, so the question I kind of have is uh, actually two of them. First of all, uh, can you kind of run down how the interrupt vector table is works? As in, you know, you have the IRQ, NMI, and and reset. There are those. How are they managed by the kernel? Because I tried. The reason why I asked is because I actually kind of gave an attempt to try and play with this on the Apple. But the problem is that the Apple doesn't have a timer, <laughs> so it's super hard to. It doesn't. No, what the kind NMI of is. Yeah, the NMI is. <laughs> well, the NMI is directly to the keyboard, and then okay. IRQ, I think, is free. So yeah. they, you can. So the question is, how would you? How are the vectors? Can you explain kind of easily how the IRQ and the uh, uh, NMI is implemented in Gecko S? Is that something you can do? Um. I'm gonna I'm gonna wuss out on that and direct you to my Senbi's commentary on Gecko S because that that answer is there it is in my commentary there and it's in extreme detail 
Um, but I think we would probably be here until dinner time if we started that discussion right now. <laughs> and, and the other one is I'm also seeing a, a complete lack of like C code, especially like from CC65. Oh, I'm seeing a, a lack of C code from, for example, something from CC65. Is that something that you can implement or? C, is that like a programming language? It, it kind of <laughs> is, yeah. Been around a bit. No, the entire thing is in 6502 assembler. There's, there's no C or any other high level language at all. It's, this is for real men, you know. <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble now. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, if there are no further questions, then as always, thank you ladies and gentlemen for your kind attention and I hope to see you next time.